Hey everybody, it's Anthony Brogdon, it's your boy, yo, it's your boy back at you again. I'm back at you again. I'm man, I'm having fun doing this. This is my man. I enjoy this a lot. And the thing about it is, I get a chance to talk with people across the country who telling their story. I don't even tell it, I let them tell it here on strong inspirations. So what happened was. Now, before I tell you what happened was, I'm going to tell you and I'm going to ask you and I'm going to plead with you and I'm going to do all I can and say, hey, hit the subscribe button. It's free. Hit the like button on one of these videos. Hit the notifications button so you notify, so you'll be notified when I come at you with another interview, another piece of content. Now, do it two, three times a week and then tell somebody about strong inspirations. All right. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, I got a book out. It's called Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts. Slaves went to college. Slaves who owned businesses used their profits to buy their freedom. I, I tell you all the way slaves gained their freedom in my book. And then I got my movie out. It's called Business in the Black. It's a documentary. See, the documentary mm -hmm. came first and then the book. And I took the doc, the documentary came out in 2017 and I took it to 40 cities across the country. And I took it to the city where the brother's sitting with me today, not to his city. I was a little bit outside his city. Never heard of Donaldson. I was in New Orleans and I was down there eating vignettes and things like that. <laughs> Having a good time. Alli alligator voodoo and all that kind of stuff. I was down there hanging showing my movie and sharing some of this knowledge that I just happened to come into. But see, now I go to the next level. I got the people who know it better than I do on Strong Inspirations. So the book and the movie is on Amazon and on my website, businessintheblack.net. All right. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to let my man here tell you his story. And I and what happened is I found him on the internet, you know, because I'd be doing a little research and whatnot, trying to find out who's who and what's what. And uh, see the next big hit for me, because I'm starting to now try to figure out the holidays, you know, the black people need to know about and Mardi Gras is coming up soon in February. So I got to thinking, let's start hitting New Orleans in that Louisiana area. And so I found my man on the internet. I called him up. The guy said, hey man, I'd love to do it. So here he is. Hey, how Take you doing? Time out his business schedule to come on Strong Inspirations. Here he is, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah, uh, my name is Daryl Hambrick. I'm uh, in Donaldsonville, Louisiana, right outside of Baton Rouge, between New Orleans, right on the Mississippi River, uh, in the heart of what is known as plantation country. That's what they refer to. Uh, tourists come from all over the world uh, to Louisiana to, to, to learn this history about plantation country. Uh, just so happened I was born in Los Angeles. My parents lived here. Grew up in uh, Louisiana, moved back to Louisiana after the uh, Watts riots. My mom said, hey, I'm getting out of California. I want to go back to Louisiana. I'd rather deal with Jim Crow and, and the rest of them than to be in Watts in the middle of those riots. My dad called us back here. I grew up here in the South, man. Uh, always wanted to go back to California. Did that, came back and realized that the South is where I was supposed to be. Man, that's beautiful. Uh, me and my sister moved back here to run our family business. I'm a licensed funeral director in the state of Louisiana. Uh, taking on the heritage that my father left, trying to keep the business going. Uh, you know about the funeral business. That's something that we always going to have, always going to be a part of. Yeah. Unfortunately, COVID has took me into a place where I'm scared to go to the funeral home now. I mean, wow. I, I, people always been scared of funeral home. I'm scared now. Wow. Uh, change the dynamics of how I live and how I do my business. In the midst of that, me and my sister got into um, the, the culture around us and realized we were in the middle of plantation country. We started going to these plantations and visiting to, to see what they were talking about. Come to find out they was telling these stories about the big house and, and the, the furniture and the people that lived in the house, but wasn't telling you anything about those people who made it possible. And here we are in the business of burying people and we're burying our history. And we decided that we couldn't do that any longer. Wow. 1994, my sister convinced him to let us have um, a space at a plantation where we could tell the story. Let me stop you right there. 
Now you on a plantation, don't that does that feel funny itself, man? I mean, you know, how does that feel? Yeah, because uh my sister had convinced these people to let us have this space, so she's got me down there painting. <laughs> I'm in there painting at the plantation. I'm going, what is this? Oh, you know, yeah, right, I'm right. I can flip. I'm working at the plantation. Right, right. <laughs> but I'm working for a different cause now. The ancestors yeah, there you go. talk to me and say, hey, you keep on working and doing what you do because they tell history, but do they tell my story? Right. His story is his story. My story is a mystery. Yes. And we need to take the mystery out of our story and make it history. And that's what we try to do here at River Road African American Museum in Donisonville, Louisiana. Now, let me ask you, what is a plantation? Let's let's go with that. What's a plantation? A plantation is, is a, a piece of property that was designated uh, specifically for planting crops. And usually, most time, it was a cash crop. And I'm going to give you a little example of this map right here behind me. If you take a look at that map, all of those little yellow and green spots there yeah. were plantations. Wow. And they all had river. This is the Mississippi River running here. Right. And every one of those pieces was sugarcane plantation. Now, if I move over to the other side, you see the pink and the blue? Yeah. That's all cotton plantations from Natchez, Mississippi, all the way down the river into Louisiana. And you'll see it convert over from pink and blue to yellow and green. Mm. That's sugarcane cotton, pink and blue cotton, yellow and green sugarcane. So there were thousands of plantations all up and down this river. And mm. Uh, we were the ones that made it possible. We were the ones who had to come clear the land, first of all, so that you could plan on it. Then we had to build the houses, build the plantation, build all the structures. Mm. And you had to farm the property. So it wasn't just you came to this place and it was already set up. Mm. This was wilderness. The other thing, Native Americans were already here when they got here. So now you got Native Americans, Africans, you got the French, you got the Spanish, all of these people interacting right here yeah. on these plantations, creating wealth for Europeans. Yeah. Let me ask you, what is, um, what's sugar cane? I, I, I hear that. Is that just sugar that I put on my, in my coffee or something? What's sugar cane? Sugar was gold during those days, during antebellum period and during the uh, slavery period. Sugar was like gold. If you had sugar on your table, it was something that determine your wealth. Uh, everybody didn't have sugar. If you sweeten something, you had to sweeten with honey or molasses or something other than sugar. So when sugar became the cash crop, that was one of the things. Europeans wanted sugar, crystallized sugar, brown sugar on their tables to sweeten their items with. And now, once that how do you grow sugar? I mean, how do you grow sugar? What is that? Sugar is grown in fields. Um, I wish it's I could take you out. I wish I could take you out in the backyard and show you. Yeah. But all around here from New Orleans all the way to Lake Charles, uh, Louisiana, sugarcane is grown. It's grown uh, in fields. It has to be planted. It has to be harvested. It has to be um, then crushed. Uh, and the juices then boiled in these big kettles to, to get the, the, the right consistency. It was hard work. Uh, and it took gang labor. That's why the plantations here in South Louisiana had so many enslaved uh, people here. Uh, it took lots of people to maintain this crop. Oh, is that right? Yeah, now, a little different. Is, from is, is, is sugar cane, uh, it, it, because of the conditions of where it is, it has to be near some moist or what have you to grow sugar cane? Yes, the Mississippi River was the fertilest ground running right through here. Before they built the levees, which hold the water back, that water would flood into all of this area, creating this fertile, fertile ground, specifically conducive for the growth of sugarcane. So mm. that's why all of those farmers came to South Louisiana, set up all these sugarcane um, plantations all along the river. Um, it was, again, a cash crop. It became more popular than cotton and um, rice or indigo. Oh, is that what's indigo? Indigo was something that they planted and used for um, coloring. Uh, it was a blue um, substance. Uh, it was grown um, for the blue that the blue 
product color that it produced. Okay. Uh, they used it for dyeing clothes, they used it oh, for painting. Okay, they used okay. it. Yeah, when you hear the color indigo as uh, blue, that's that's and it was poisonous and was causing um, death among the enslaved. So they stopped growing it. it, it oh really? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. But, now, uh, is there one plantation that was the biggest one on the near uh, along right the here where I am? Like there's that? one right here in in in, in Ascension Parish where I live is one called Homeless House Plantation, which was one of the largest properties. He, um, he purchased over 500 slaves from South Carolina in 1858. Would you believe they walked from South Carolina to Louisiana? This was after the international slave trade had been abolished and that it was no longer um, legal to transport from one continent to the other, they start transporting us within the United States. Yeah, so yeah. they sell us from one side, and most times it came from Virginia and on the East Coast into Louisiana as as it progressed westward. Now you said that was 1850, but slavery was 16, 19, and what have you. So did slavery right. in the 16? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So so did slavery in start like in South Carolina, and then move down further south? Is that the way it went? Right. You're correct. The, the 13 colonies, the original colonies is where it all began. Uh, Louisiana was still part of the um, Louisiana Territory, Louisiana Purchase. Uh, Louisiana got into slavery in the 1700s. So it's almost 100 years later after what's going on on the East Coast. Now you have planters who have plantations not only in Virginia, but they have them in Louisiana. So now they're transporting their wealth from one place to the other. They're also transporting their the, the enslaved people to those places to work for them as well. Families, sisters, brothers would open plantations, cousins, and then they would swap and sell uh, enslaved people I uh, see. amongst those plantations. Is there, is there uh, could ships come from uh, wherever they brought slaves to Louisiana? New or did Orleans they have to bring them inland, so to speak? New Orleans was the largest slave port um, in the South. You, you control the Mississippi River, you control everything going up it and everything coming out of it. And um, the French knew that and that's what the, they were fighting for. Whoever controlled the mouth of the Mississippi River, controlled all the cotton, all the sugar, everything coming up and down, any, in, any kind of transportation of uh, merchandise coming in and out that river was, was there. New Orleans was a place and then Donisonville becomes the second to third oldest city in the state of Louisiana. So right up river from New Orleans, when you left on a ship or headed north, you would stop in Donisonville as the next port. Also, we have here is a bayou that runs from here into the Mississippi River and goes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So you could come in the bayou and get into Donisonville without going through New Orleans. And so it was <laughs> kind of like a little, a little shortcut. And it was a pirate by the name of Jean Lafitte who used it very often, smuggling slaves, smuggling alcohol, you name it. Now, right Bayou, is that, is that a lake or what is a bayou? A bayou is a small river and it usually flows in both directions. A river usually one, runs in one direction, but a bayou is controlled by the tides. It's usually connected to a larger portion of water, such as the Gulf of Mexico. When the water comes up in the Gulf, so does the water go up in the bayou and the tide goes both ways. Mm. Um, a river usually runs uh, north and south, and I think um, by east, east and west. Uh, you know, when you think of slavery, uh, to me, I think of uh, Alabama and Mississippi and uh, uh, maybe those two in particular, maybe some Virginia. I think of them as the most vicious ones. Were they vicious in, in Louisiana? I mean, the owners? Louisiana had two different kinds of places. The northern part of Louisiana was, was, was totally different from Creole South Louisiana. When you talk about French Creole South, you're talking about uh, Catholics, you're talking about French who are risque and, and did not have all of the, the, the particulars as the Englishmen. They would allow um, uh, families to have multiple, you could have the plantation owner would have a black family and a white family. Uh, and it would be okay here in Creole, Louisiana, but in northern parts of Mississippi and places like that, that was kind of a... Uh, Hold on, stop me there. Say that again. They would have a black and a white family. What do you mean? What do you oh, mean? yeah, you'd have two families. He'd have a mistress, 
And he'd also have his wife who was at home taking care of his kids. Okay, so let me stop you right plantation. there. What I thought the mistress was, was the wife of the house. Mm -mm. No, the wife was his wife. He'd have her at the plantation. In New Orleans, he'd have a, a, a cottage or a, a, a house in the city. He would also, he would leave his wife and children uh, at the plantation and go down to New Orleans and hang out with his other family and create, you know, so they had multiple things going on, especially in Creole, uh, you're talking about South Louisiana. And, and, uh, and, and so there was a lot of mixing of the races too, the white guy with the black women and that kind of thing, right? Yes, and we have the largest population of uh, free people of color outside of New Orleans. So there were free people also living amongst those who were enslaved. Some of them were given their freedom. Some of them bought their freedom. Some of them were never enslaved and had freedom when they came here. Um, so can you imagine those dimensions? You got free people, you got uh, people who are not free, who are both looking, speaking the same language. They're yeah. going to Catholic churches, they're blending in. Their, their colors uh, go from one extreme to the other extreme yeah. to where sometimes you can't tell whether they're white or black. Sure. And so you had situations where we would buy, we would go back and buy our family out. Yeah. Um, or the yeah. white man would go back and buy them out because he knew that was his black family. Wow. Okay, hold on. You really, you, you, you're blowing my mind. How about this? I'm free and my man ain't free. How does the white man know who's free and who's not free? Well, you had some papers that you carried around, which you call. Oh, man. really? You had to, like a driver's license, and you had to be able to keep that with you. And you didn't just go everywhere just because you was free. You stayed in within your confines to know that, because sometimes you could get somewhere and if the wrong person stopped you, those papers, you know, you think those papers were that important? Yeah, right. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so sometimes there's a place right, up, right down the river here called Freetown where free individuals lived within a community where they were free. They could um, be educated. They uh, had the ability to have some kind of business or if they were ironers or, or had some kind of skill, they could go out and sell their wares and become, you know, and operate just like people freely wow. um, amongst them. And it was recognized in French Creole, Louisiana, it was more recognized that you had those kind of people. In Mississippi, uh, they didn't play that too much. Uh, you yeah. see, you know, other places, they didn't allow you to have that. But this is Creole, South Louisiana. Creoles are all around the uh, Caribbean. You think about South America. All of those people were uh, sometimes either French or Spanish speaking people who were connected to Louisiana. That's why New Orleans has a flavor all of its own because of that French and African, Native American, all of those mixtures that happen right here on this soil. Okay, how about this? What does Creole mean? What is Creole? Creole, let's take a look at that right here on this. If you take a look at this banner right here. Oh man, you're doing it for us, brother. Creole, Demond. You got all of these different pronunciations from different places. Creole can be Spanish, Creole can be French. Um, if you were in Jamaica, they talk about Creoles. If you're in um, Haiti or if you're in New Orleans, all around the Caribbeans, it was the mixture of African, French, Spanish, uh, and then the natives. Uh, here in the United States, Creoles, if you were on a plantation and your children were not born in Europe, they called them Creole if you were in the South because they wanted them to be a part of that Creole culture. And so Creole was part of a culture. You had to be French speaking, um, attend a Catholic church. And um, I think there's one other thing. Let's see. Either be French or Spanish. Okay. You know, you had Spanish Catholics and you had French Catholics. So you, you, one of those combinations in Louisiana, they mixed all, all of that together, creating okay. a, a whole new culture that was not American. Okay. They were not Americans and they were not part of the U.S. of A. Creoles had their own language, had their own culture. They were totally different from the rest of uh, Louisiana. You. you go to northern Louisiana, anywhere else, if you're not Creole, then you were almost a foreigner. Okay. Let me ask you this, and maybe you might know the answer to this. This right here might be a deep question. If, if I was in Africa and somebody invaded from Europe, would I rather them be French, British, or German people who took me? You know what I'm saying? 
It sounds like the question. fridge wasn't wasn't you know that added another flavor than the rest of them did. Is that that's what we got out of this? Yeah, to the point where they would start to um, bamboozle us and think that okay, it's better to deal with the French than to deal with the Dutch, or it's better to we were all being enslaved regardless. And so, but they would use those kind of tactics to to sway us maybe not to sell to the Dutch or to sell directly to the French or to exchange with them or for them. They went into certain areas too. They didn't just go to Africa. They went into the Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, um, uh, Gambia, and all of those places where they knew these Africans had agricultural skills. They had um, the ability to craftsmen. They were all kinds of uh, specialties that we had um, uh, that they needed and the resources. And, and we were a strong, People. We still are strong people, and, and uh, through that process, um, we've been broken in, in many instances, but yet not defeated. Oh, oh, for sure, brother. I sit here today to, to even tell you that, and that's oh, part for of sure, that brother. No question. Um, uh, I don't know what else to ask you. Is there another question, or is there something else that happened? In, well, like, is Donaldson known for? I know the plantation, yeah, but well, there's something well, well, else. Let's let's take a look at some political stuff right now since yeah, we're in yeah, there. Yeah, take us a minute. Yeah. We're gonna look at this reconstruction. You talk about reconstruction. You know anything about reconstruction? Uh yeah, I know after slavery ended, right. Right. Take a look at this photo here. Can you see that? Yeah. That's a reconstruction poster. The guy sitting in the middle is OJ Dunn. He was the Lieutenant Governor doing reconstruction for um, Louisiana. And you see that pretty good? Yeah, 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 yeah. All of those guys sitting around him were the House of Representatives in 1868. Your finger's in the way. My there you go, okay. All of those guys sitting around him is from the yeah. convention assembly in 1868, all of these black guys were elected. Can you imagine having a vote in this box right here? Yeah. Donaldsonville elected this guy right here, whose name is Pierre Landry. He's the first black mayor elected in the United States. Yeah. Not only was he a mayor, but he was a minister, a Methodist minister, he was a lawyer. He was the founding member of Dillard University, which was New Orleans University at yeah, that time. Yeah, He was a Methodist minister. So you got the Catholics over here uh, doing their thing. So now the Methodists are coming in and they want to be a part of this education building and building of churches. And so Pierre Landry becomes a minister. He founds a church. He founds schools. He opens up um, places that um, we can, can better ourselves. And so Reconstruction had us on the move to where we could, you know, change the way we live, the way we think. Mm. Uh, and this guy here, Pierre Landry, man, his his mother enslaved his father, one of the um, overseers, masters on the plantation, mm. born free, raised by a family of free people of color. So they taught him how to read and write. He could, you know, move freely. But he was sold back into slavery at the age of of uh, 13 for $1,665. The plantation, uh, the, the owner dies and they do a succession. He sells everything, including this young boy. Oh. Sells him to the plantation, but because of his education, he could read and write better than anybody. Some of the masters couldn't even read and write as better as this guy. So he becomes very um, prolific in the, in, the, in the movement. He, he works in the, in the general store. And if you manage the general store on the plantation, you pretty much run the entire plantation. Yeah. He becomes a confectionery. He's making all kinds of sweets and stuff with sugar and people like him. And he has this ability to deal with the big house as well as the people in the, in the back house. Yeah. When he, three years later in 1865, he's free. He moves to Donaldsonville. Three years later, he becomes the mayor the first black mayor elected anywhere in the United States. Wow. That was the mayor of Donisonville. And mm. so this history right here says a lot about this city and what was going on, yeah. where it's located, um, who, who was in control, 
uh, how much control they had and how we were moving ourselves forward and trying to fit into a system where we could either be a mayor, a governor, a lieutenant yeah. governor, yeah. Uh, uh, and represent our people just like we see them representing today. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, the last question, I guess, did people in New Orleans want to come to Donaldsonville? Was that like a more of a Mecca per se? Yes, and if you go to New Orleans today, there are many families who have relatives here in Donaldsonville that live in New Orleans. It was, you could catch a train at the end of the street here and go to New Orleans. You could catch a ship or barge and go into New Orleans. So it was like, you know, there was lots of commerce going on so you could get in and out of here. And it was the next major stop once you left New Orleans. So yeah. New Orleans and uh, Donaldsonville had close ties and, and this was destined to become the next major city, I think outside of New Orleans. Oh, okay. It was once the state capital for one year from 1830 to 1831. Okay. Um, well, so hey brother man, um, you, 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 I know we, we could go through that whole museum if you let us, we'd have to pay emissions and stuff like yeah, that. Well, <laughs> but what you do is, what we want you to do is yeah. you go, to, go to our website. Go right, to, what's the uh, website, yeah. Yeah, go to the um, AA, -A Excuse me, AfricanAmericanMuseum.org, AfricanAmericanMuseum.org. You can go to our website. We have some virtual exhibits. We got some. Um, we have some um, oral histories of local people talking about their families and how their families were a part of this community, what they remember. Um, and we also have five buildings that we're collecting. So go and learn a little bit about hey. this. It's been 25 years in the making. We need your support out there. If you yeah. want to be a part of what we're doing here in Donaldsonville, go to our website, make a donation, support us here at River Road African American Museum. Um, All right. Doing great things here in South Louisiana. We're trying to make a difference yeah. in a place where we made differences a long time ago. Yeah. Is it, look, like, I got one more last question. Is there a <laughs> festival in Donaldsonville or something like that or... Do, we, do the we, museum uh, do something that they can commemorate something? Yeah, uh, we do a big festival every year. Uh, we used to do the Juneteenth Festival. Okay. And, you know, we had a hard time with Juneteenth. We used to struggle Juneteenth, Juneteenth, and, and people didn't even know what Juneteenth was. Yeah. And, and we built it up, and, and people began to, to come out, and, and we were losing focus on what we were supposed to be doing here at the museum. So we kind of yeah, gave it off to you. someone else, passed it on. And now Juneteenth is the biggest thing that ever happened. Everybody knows what Juneteenth, even white people today know what Juneteenth is. Yeah, when, there was no time when black people, we celebrate Cinco de Mayo and everybody else's, you know, mm -hmm. independence, but what about our own independence? Yeah, so. no question. Well, hey, Brother Daryl, man, I thank you so very much for coming on, everybody. I told you it was going to be deep. Oh, yeah. I told you, I, I'm finding the people that know straight, no chaser. I don't even have to do nothing but ask a question and let it be. But check out the, go to his website, people, and uh, uh, follow up on this. Learn a little bit more. There's a whole lot out of Louisiana that we're learning together. And I appreciate you coming on Strong Inspirations and giving us this information. I appreciate you doing what you're doing. Uh, everybody, you know, check out my book, hit the subscribe, hit the like, tell somebody about Strong Inspirations and do this. Stay strong. Stay on your grind, Brother Daryl. Stay safe, yes, please. Yes, sir. Everybody, we try to keep it safe. Uh, thank you for coming out again once again today. Um, I, I got love for you. Thank I'll be you. back. Thanks, man. Peace out. Peace. Peace out.